So thank you, Sudhir, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So as stated, I'll be talking about Bell 2 and its prospects. So initially, I'll just introduce Bell 2. This is the only talk on flavor physics here at the meeting. Um, so that'll be quite a lengthy introduction. Then I'll talk about a few recent highlights. We're running experiment, we're producing results. So I'll give just three examples, one related to CP violation, one related to the anomalies that Rukmini talked about just before uh, the tea break, and then also explain we're not just about B physics. I'll show one measurement that comes from a search in the dark sector before I conclude talking about the prospects. So why Bell 2? It's, uh, okay. So hopefully that's better, less static. So Bell 2 is an experiment that uh, predominantly runs at the center of mass energy of the Upsilon 4S in E plus E minus collisions and produces BB bar pairs. So we're a B physics experiment primarily. And this environment is just above the threshold for production just over 10 GeV in center of mass. So the bees are produced in a low multiplicity environment. There are no accompanying particles apart from the B mesons. And also being E plus E minus, we have very good kinematic constraints. So it's also built on a legacy and I'll talk more about that in a moment, but there were two predecessors, Bell and Bell II, um, not Bell and Bell II, Bell and Baba, which um, collected one and a half inverse atabans of data. And the goal of Bell 2 is essentially to expand that data set by a factor of 30 to get up towards 50 inverse uh, atobans. So just to set the scale, because I'll compare it to LHCB in a bit, one inverse atoban is around 1 billion BB bar pairs. So there are three main goals, I would say, in the Bell 2 program. Um, the one we're famous for is the CKM metrology. This is measuring both the angles and the sides at this, uh, the unitarity triangle, which I'll come back to, whether it be through semi-leptonic decays, through mixing, or through CP violation. So the goal is to make many such measurements and find some that disagree, some are more or less sensitive to new physics. And in particular, the new physics can enter in these flavor changing neutral current diagrams. So we have many penguin diagrams of different types. We have so-called electroweak ones, which lead to this B to S LL process. Then we have gluonic penguins, which give a hadronic final state, but also potentially contain new physics within this loop. And then we have the purely radiative penguins, which I won't have time to talk about, but that's a very important part of our program as well. But at this center of mass energy in E plus E minus collisions, it's not just bees. The cross section for charm and for taus is almost equal to that of B mesons. So we have very large charm samples and a very a uh, large number, in fact, world leading number of tau decays as well. There's also great interest in spectroscopy that can be done both from B decays and also in ISR, where you reduce the center of mass to produce exotic states in the Charmonium region. I'll talk more about the dark sector. And then there's this important contribution of measuring low multiplicity final state E plus E minus to pi pi gamma, which is goes into the calculations of G minus two. So, As I said, this is based on success from earlier experiments, Bell and Baba. So this is, as a function of running time, various measurements that were made by Baba and Bell over time. And they encompass rare decays, the first observation of beta KLL, they invert, the first CP violation in the B sector, which led to the Nobel Prize for Kobayashi and Maskawa. And then there's the B to D star, the first D star town new measurements, the first of these various exotic hadrons, dark sector and other things going on. But you see this program finished in 2010. So in the last decade or so, flavor physics has moved elsewhere. And now the leader, which I should talk about is LHCB, which has been running very successfully since the start of the LHC. They exploit the very large cross section for BB bar production in proton-proton collisions at the LHC. And this leads to trillions of BB bar events per two inverse femtobands. So they've collected nine inverse femtobands of data so far. They're a dedicated experiment, having a forward geometry with the bees boosted into the acceptance so they can exploit the displaced vertex. They've installed 
excellent particle identification detectors, and they can also dedicate the whole of their trigger bandwidth to flavor physics. So, uh, and now they're going to run with 40 megahertz readouts or are started to run. So they, they've made many measurements that um, Rukamini showed and also have made great impact on those unitarity triangle measurements. So, but just to give you a sense, if you can see in this event display picture, there's a very busy environment. Here is a BS to Mu Mu event or candidate. You see the two muons going through, but there are many, many other tracks and, and the, the, the events are not as clean as what one gets at any plus e minus uh, experiment. But given its success, you might ask yourself why we're still doing flavor physics somewhere else. And the answer simply is that there is complementarity between the two programs. So even though we suffer from having a much lower cross section at Bell 2, we're trying to compensate for that by having a very large luminosity. And I'll talk about how we do that in a moment. We have lower backgrounds, we have higher efficiencies, we have almost 100% trigger for uh, BB events. We can reconstruct neutral particles very well. We have well-constrained kinematics. We don't quite have, have as good decay time resolution because the boost is lower, but we manage. Um, and we have a very tiny beam spot now, which helps. We don't produce B mesons other than the B plus and B zero very much. We could run at the 5S and produce BS mesons. This was done by uh, Bell. Uh, they has a sample of the BS, BS bar produced there. We have this tau physics capability. And we also do very well in CP violation measurements by boosting our flavor tagging efficiency. The B0 and B0 bar pair are produced in a quantum correlated state, which means that we get a much higher efficiency in our tagging. So hopefully this has motivated us to uh, do Bell 2. Now the question is, how do we do this? And the answer is with very high instantaneous luminosities. So this is a plot, I think, shown by Frank yesterday or a similar one to this, which shows various colliders over a period of several decades, half a century in fact, where you see the instantaneous luminosity rising. So for a long time, uh, Keck B, the uh, accelerator for Bell was the world's leading in terms of instantaneous luminosity. And this is the projection for Super Keck B. We haven't achieved that this, so we've gone off the end of this, uh, this chart, but we're closer to this line now, which is gonna try and push up that luminosity to well above 10 to the 35. In fact, six times 10 to the 35 is the target. And currently we're running at four times 10 to the 34 is the, the record that we have reached so far. So how do we get this increase in luminosity? So in, in this formula here, there are various factors on which the luminosity depends. There are two most important parameters here, of course, is the beam current, which you can increase to increase your luminosity, or you can decrease this beta star uh, function, which is basically making the beam size in the vertical direction at the interaction point very, very small. You have to pay attention to this beam beam parameter as well, which is actually proportional to this beta star. So if you make this beta star smaller, you also reduce this parameter. So you have to make sure that your emittance also decreases in a similar way so that this doesn't destroy the luminosity gain you're getting from the increase in beta star. So there were brute force ideas. You just increase the current, but that doesn't really work so well. It's very expensive because of the RF costs, and it would also create so much synchrotron radiation. It's very hard to make the, um, it was very hard to make the beam pipe. So another solution was chosen, which was to make this beta star 20 times smaller than super Keck B. And these cartoons here show the bunches crossing. This is what happened at Bell. There are these sort of Gaussian like ovals of positrons and electrons crossing. But at uh, Bell 2 and super Keck B, due to a very elaborate final focus, which again was talked about by Frank yesterday, we can get a very small uh, crossing region due to this hourglass shape of the bunches. And it's down to the nanometer scale. So this is called the nano beam scheme. So this is the upgrade to, the, uh, to Keck B that led to Super Keck B. Yellow bits are bits that were replaced uh, from the original uh, Keck B collider. So there are many, many parts to this. Um, importantly, as I mentioned, we also have to take care of the emittance, those additional damping rings, and the RF was redesigned. Uh, so, uh, so uh, no, not the dipole, sorry, were redesigned to reduce the uh, uh, emittance. There's more RF power because there are higher currents, and of course, the final focus, which is key to getting this very small beta star, was completely redesigned. So that was what was going on during the last decade. This accelerator was being prepared. 
So it's been running and we've been collecting data. Um, we started running with a full instrumented detector in 2019, slow start. We managed to run all the way through the pandemic, which was actually a, quite a remarkable achievement, very much the dedication of our colleagues at, uh, at, at Keck uh, led to this. Um, and uh, others around the world were operating their detectors from the front rooms. But we uh, now increased again the, uh, the luminosity. And in the last year, we integrated the largest sample so far. And we are up to um, just over 400, 427 inverse femtobarns of data, or 0.4 at inverse atobarns, which is the unit we should be talking about with uh, SuperKEC B. I'll come back to this at the end. But with this sample of data, this is already the size of what the bar collected, essentially. So we can do some physics with this. So the experiment then is, is Bell 2, and the Bell 2 collaboration is a large one. It's a thousand experimentalists from across the globe, relatively evenly spread between the Americas, Asia, and Europe. And as you can see, there's a significant Indian contribution to the experiment. There are around 50 of us in India. There are four IITs, NIT Jaipur, Isa Mahali, TIFR, uh, Punjab University and Punjab Agricultural University, and this university UPES in Derdun has recently joined. So we, we've also been involved with Bell. This isn't a recent engagement at all. We've been engaged with the program for, I think, 20 years. Is that right, Gagan? Yeah. So um, that's a collaboration. This is the detector. So um, there's this asymmetry in the beams, which I haven't actually mentioned. There are eight uh, GeV electrons and three GeV protons coming in. This creates a boost. So our beam mesons fly some distance before they decay. We exploit. The, um, the time dilation so we can make time dependent measurements. And uh, we have the usual things that are required for a flavor experiment. We have excellent silicon tracking with a, and vertexing with the six layer vertex detector, two layers of pixels and two layers of double-sided silicon. We have a, uh, a, a drift chamber, low mass drift chamber for momentum measurements and an electromagnetic calorimeter, which is uh, uh, cesium iodide thallium doped which is the same as Bell's, in fact, it's just had the electronics upgraded all inside our solenoid. Then outside that, we have um, our muon system, which can also detect K-longs, which is instrumented iron flux return. So there's also dedicated PID in the forward region coming from aerogel or uh, Cherenkov counters. So this is the detector. I've highlighted in the red box the silicon because I just want to say a few more words about that before I move on to the physics. So the, uh, the, the silicon vertex detector had a large Indian contribution. Um, under the leadership of TIFR, we built the fourth layer, which is double-sided silicon detectors. So it's the second of the four double-sided silicon detectors. Uh, there's some uh, interesting things about the readout. There's this, uh, so there's this chip-on sensor design, so-called origami to keep uh, the readout close to the sensors and the, the mass low. And uh, we were a key part of this and various contributors from other institutes, as well as the leadership from TIFR, we, we've successfully contributed to this detector working. And to prove that it's working, a couple of plots and one publication here. So um, this is the impact parameter resolution as a function of a variable that pretty much depends on the momentum, taking into account the angle at which the particle traverses the silicon. And the red is the Bell impact parameter resolution, and the blue is what we now have in Bell 2. This is, this is a, 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 a prediction. This isn't actually the data, but we've matched up to this when we, we actually looked at this. I should have replaced this plot, in fact. And as you can see, it's almost a factor of two improvement over the full, full momentum range. So that leads to physics and one of our early publications, we actually now have three such publications, are measuring charm lifetimes. So here is the distribution of the charm uh, li uh, lifetime measured in the detector for D0 decays, uh, which are tagged for coming from a D star that cleans up the sample. This is D0 to K pi. And on, on this side, uh, you, you, you can see the, the charm, but on the negative side, you're seeing the resolution that you have on the lifetime. And uh, again, the, this, this 
plot here shows the improvement that we get from Bell 2. This is this line here, and this was what Babar and Bell had. So there's a significant improvement. And this has been leveraged to get world-leading measurements of the D lifetimes, which are important in terms of QCD predictions for these, and also as benchmarks for other lifetimes in the Charm sector. So that's uh, an introduction to the detector, and I want to talk about various parts of the physics. So the first of these is just a little bit about CP violation and showing that we're prepared now to make uh, accurate measurements of interesting processes in, in, in CP violation. And to do that, first of all, I just want to say a bit more about the CKM matrix, which was shown to you by Rukmini in the uh, talk before the tea break that we, we like to use this Wolfenstein parameterization, where this lambda parameter is an expansion parameter that is the, the sign of the Kabibo angle, which is around 0.22. So we, we, we first of all write down the terms up to third order in this lambda parameter. And what you see by this is that the, these other parameters, this A, rho, and eta are there, and they tend to sit in these uh, terms which are coupling together the first and the third generation. And importantly, eta is the one that makes these elements complex. And the complex nature of these elements is what ultimately leads to the CP violation. So we exploit this um, relationship to combine together the first and the third column. And that can be seen as just adding together three complex numbers and they have to sum to zero. So that gives us a unitarity triangle. But what's nice about the first and the third column is that all of these terms are of the same order in lambda. They're all lambda cubed. So the lengths of the sides are approximately the same length. So in the B system, each of these sides depends on some coupling of the B, either to the up quark, the top quark, or the charm quark. So using B physics allows us to measure everything and more about the unitarity triangle. And the key measurement that was made that showed that the kobayashi Maskawa mechanism was correct in describing CP violation in the standard model was to measure this angle beta down here, which is, uh, can be cleanly related, of course, to this eta parameter. And this is sine two beta measurements were key to the initial B physics program at the B factories. So how this measurement works is that you take a final state of the B decay to a CP eigenstate, in this case, J psi K short. Um, and this, this final state can be reached in an identical fashion for B0 or B0 bar. However, because the B0 and the B0 bar mix, you don't know whether it decays before or after it's, it's, uh, it's mixed, and therefore interference builds up. And that interference, because of this box diagram, depends on DTD, which if you remember from the previous slide is one of those that depends on one of the, on ETA and it is complex. So you can measure the CP violation by measuring how the amount of, uh, how this varies as a function of time because you depend upon the oscillation. So you build up a time dependent asymmetry, which depends on the difference in time between the two decays. I'll explain that on the next slide. So you just look to see how many B0 bars were born decay to this final state and B0 as a, as a function of time. And you work this through and you find that the coefficients of the two terms that depend on the mixing rate for B mesons, delta MD, there's a sine term where the coefficient is exactly sine two beta, and you have a, a, a cosine term which leads to direct CP violation, which is actually zero in the standard model. So um, we made our first measurement of sine two beta at Bell two and presented it at ICHEP this year. So this asymmetry of the collider comes into play here where our two Bs are boosted forward in the lab frame and they fly a significant distance before they decay. And we rely on knowing the flavor of the B0 here in red that decays to our signal from the B0 bar on the other side as it decays. So if it decays to say a lepton, we'll be able to tell what it was at this time. And because of the quantum coherence, they, they evolve together until the point of one of them decays. And then we measure as a function of the distance between these two decay points, um, how many B0 and B0 bars we see. And then this decays to a very clean final state. Um, it relies on this tagging efficiency that we have, of, and this has been measured now to be around 30% as expected, and comes from the fact that this, this quantum coherence means that we're not 
oscillating freely like they are at LHCB, or even it can hadronize to something which you don't get the, the tag correctly and you rely on same side tagging and things which are much more difficult in the hadronic environment. So also we exploit our kinematics. This is one of our common variables, delta E, where the energy of the B less the mass of one of the beams in the center of mass frame should equal to zero. So we get a large peak of the signal here at zero in this JSI K short final state. And we have nearly 3000 candidates in the sample used for this analysis with very small background. So those events are then taken and um, they're turned into a CP asymmetry. So the red are the, those who are tagged at the time of the first decay to be B0 and those B0 bar. And you can see um, that if the, if the signal one decays first, you end up with a negative time difference and positive if it's, um, it decays after the tagging one. But what you see is a distinct difference as a function of time, and then you fit this nice sinusoidal form to it, and you get out your uh, coefficient for the sinusoidal term, which should be sine two beta, and it agrees well with previous measurements. And we don't see any evidence yet for any direct CP violation also agreeing with the standard model. So this table of systematics I just flash here, I think I shouldn't go into too much detail given the amount of time I have, but it's important to note that many of these systematics actually will decrease with more data largely data driven there are things that we can understand better with more data so why we're doing this of course is a validation to show what we could do as well now as we could do before but we're ultimately interested in other final states to cp eigenstates such as 5k short and eta prime k short where that gluonic penguin can play a role and potentially there's a new phase will come in which will shift the value of sine 2 beta and those are the next measurements that we can expect now we've done this validation using JSI K short. So moving on now to something slightly more exciting, maybe we'll talk about a measurement that's related to uh, the anomalies that were talked about. Of course, ultimately we will look at B to S LL and also at B to D star tau nu, and this is gonna come probably relatively soon. However, we suffer statistically in this mode compared with LHCB though we have a great advantage in terms of uh, lepton universality that the efficiency for detecting electrons is almost the same as that for muons, which is very different to what happens in the general purpose detectors at the LHC. Of course, as, as Rukmini said, I should just emphasize these anomalies are of rather different types. The flavor changing neutral current ones are completely dominated by loop processes. So there are many possible new physics explanations here. That's what's going on inside these loops that could change what we expect from the standard model. So that's the pro of these types of decays. There are many possible new physics answers to why they might differ. The con, of course, is it's only been observed by one experiment. And ultimately, of course, we should make measurements that will uh, see this, but we need many atabans of data to do so. For B to C tau nu, this is, you know, three experiments have seen the same thing, but it's a very hard measurement to make. The backgrounds are very, very large but they are different in the hadronic and the E plus E minus environment. So we just need to measure this more precisely. But of course, the physics has to be near the electroweak scale because it's at the tree level in the decay that has significant impact. So I'm not talking about to charge leptons, but there's something that's rather unique about um, the E plus E minus environment that you can actually measure nothing very well. So we're looking at BS to new new bar. So this is one of these loop diagrams here where you just have a, a Z coupling to new new bar. And this can be predicted reasonably well within the standard model. Um, and this is obviously complementary to anything that's going on in the charge case. There should be equivalent kind of effects here. And if there aren't, that tells you something about the new physics that might be there in the charged leptons. So we've developed uh, inclusive tagging approach, which exploits differences in the shape of the events. Can, when you compare our BB bar events in the center of mass, they're produced almost at rest. So they're isotropically distributing the particles over the four pi acceptance of our detector. Whereas a QQ bar event is kind of jetty back to back to one another. So you can easily distinguish, not easily, but you can distinguish these two types of events based on their topology. Now, this K nu nu bar is interesting because it sort of lies between the two. You have one regularly decaying B, you just have a single track on the other side. So what we do is we train multivariate algorithms to distinguish our signal against QQ bar and then against BB bar. 
and we use a, a series of nested BDTs to do this, and we can get a, 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 around a 4% efficiency for selecting these events. We also can use more um, a tree level BDK processes such as BTK JSI, where we ignore the muons to sort of fake our signal. And we, we even alter the kinematics so the kaons look like those coming from a three body decay. And what we find is that our data agrees well um, with our simulation. So that gives us confidence in the result. So just using only 63 inverse femtobarns of data, this is the purple measurement up here, which is competitive with other measurements that have been made in the past. And clearly now we have five times more data, we will update this soon. So we'll be able to say something about the anomalies hopefully before too long. So my final physics topic before I conclude is just something on the dark sector. So um, there, there, there's a lot of interest in, in, in certain models. Um, it, one here is L nu minus L tau uh, scenario. We have a new gauge boson the Z prime, which couples just to the second and third generation. So you escape all the constraints that are there from uh, electrons and, and, and quark couplings. And um, this is of interest because it can explain G minus two and is also possibly related to the other anomalies that we see in the B sector. Um, so this signature is quite clean in our environment. What, what, what we have is E plus E minus going to mu plus mu minus, and we have a Z prime Strahlung process off one of the muons because it can couple to that. And then we're interested in particular to the Z prime coupling uh, decaying invisibly. This can happen if it goes to neutrinos, but more, more interestingly, it can couple to the dark sector. And then you'd have your Z prime going to Kai Kai bar as a dark matter candidate. So our signature is just a pair of muons and lots of missing energy, and we can work out the recoil from our constrained kinematics. So this is the recoil mass here. And we can search across this looking for a peak which would correspond to our Z prime. So there are various backgrounds that are more dominant at different regions of the recoil mass. You have four fermion processes, and then you have radiative uh, mu plus mu minus and tau plus tau minus as well, where you miss the photon. So there's been careful studies of the backgrounds. There are certain gaps in the detector, which we know about, and we veto those. And we can turn this then into a cross section uh, as a function of the potential Z prime mass. This, uh, so this is the regular expected limit against what we see as a function of scanning along in the mass. Unfortunately, we don't see anything. Of course, we, you would have heard if we had, but uh, when you recast this in terms of this L nu L minus L tau model, you can compare to what you might expect the couplings to be if it could explain the G minus two, which is the pink band here. And as you see, we are actually excluding a significant region of the MZ prime mass that could explain this with this measurement. And this again is being done with very little data, just 80 inverse femtobarns of data. So it will improve with time. So in my last few moments, I have to address one thing. Oh no, I, just to show you actually before I get to that, we have many other results. We had 16 new results for iChep, spanning semi-leptonics decays, CP violation, quarkonium, tau physics, dark sector, and one more charm lifetime. But there is a, a local thing we have to address. There is an elephant in the room with Bell 2 and its prospects. Um, those of you with a memory like an elephant will know that we have been claiming for a long time that Bell 2 would have around five inverse acid of data by now. This has not happened. There are various reasons for this, but this largely down to the fact that when you're trying to uh, produce the world's largest luminosity collider, there are problems. And, and we've suffered greatly from backgrounds within the detector which have been so high that we've had to abort the beams. There have been lots of losses of beams very fast in the, in the accelerator and lots of problems in injection. So we have not got to where we wanted to be. And, and, and we, we've now had to revise our plans such that Bell 2 is running well into the middle of the next decade to possibly get 50 inverse atabans. But to be clear about this, we, we, we are here at the moment. We are shut down to make improvements to the accelerator and to install our whole vertex detector. And then there is a path that we can actually enter the quite exciting 10 to the 35 inverse centimeter squared regime and accumulate a data set before we shut down again by around the end of 2026 or 2027, which will be multiple atabarns, five or six inverse atabarns probably. Then we have to do a serious upgrade of the whole detector to push up to get to the very high instantaneous luminosities and the very large data sets. So people are thinking about 
um, well, actually very actively now thinking about upgrading Bell 2 when we um, are shut down for this, this long shutdown to, 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 to improve the accelerator. And the, one of the key things is we have to change the final focus, which means we essentially we have to change our silicon detector as well. And various things about the, the, the tracking and whatever will change around that. And we can use this opportunity to make further upgrades. So this is ongoing process. We expect a conceptual design report this year, a technical design report next year, and we're looking to be ready to go three years after that. These are incremental upgrades, um, the, probably the biggest of which is for the VXD. So I should conclude. I'm now 30 seconds over time, sorry. Uh, if you're interested in lists of how our precision is on these key modes over a period of time, we did this exercise last year for snow mass, and this is the link to the report. Um, but I just want to show, I hopefully shown you we're up and running, we're producing physics. Um, and, and we've now got this quite large data set similar to what Baba had, and we're going to exploit that as best we can during this long shutdown period. And we'll be getting some interesting revolt results in the next year or so. And we're benefiting from improvement techniques, particularly machine learning. But then we'll push on into this 10 to the 35 regime, and we will then lead on various measurements, particularly related to missing energy neutrals, tau, and dark sector. And the 50 inverse outer bonds is unclear, but we're working hard on this. And uh, it's, uh, it's a long-term program that we hope to uh, we'll tell you more about in the years ahead. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jim. Very wonderful talk, actually. Follows, yeah. The Z prime yeah. in the dark matter kind of thing that you said. It, what was the mass? It's too light for uh, how about LHC searches? And LHC? It's very light. So we, we've excluded in the range from just below 1 GeV up to around 5 GeV. I mean, yeah, but that's already, uh, I mean, what about the LHC Z prime kind of? Uh, no, that's so, already in the. So what's key here is this is Z yeah. prime to invisible. So if there's a coupling between the Z prime and the dark sector, that could well saturate the branching fraction, okay? So these are the first limits on a model of the Z prime, which is decaying to dark matter. 100%. Oh, yeah. Okay. Of course, when you look for the Z prime going to dimuons or dielectrons or something else, you'll get much more stringent limits, but there's models that predict that if you couple to the dark sector, you will end up with this being the dominant decay mode. So you wouldn't see it there, okay? I'll make two small questions. I noticed that uh, you have seven, seven GV on four GV. That's a yeah, mistake. Like, that is different from eight on yeah, yeah. That's the, that? That, uh, because I didn't check my slides carefully. That's the bell numbers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> or is that yeah? That's or is right. that a typo or something? Okay, that's a typo. The, the I, I, had, I, had, I, had, I had eight earlier, which is yeah. the wrong way around, okay. right? I got anyway. Okay. The question is keeping me honest. With that. Violet that you would like to observe. So Sorry, maybe I missed that. Direct T symmetry violation. Direct T, I didn't talk about today. Right, but maybe... time, time dependent CP violation. Oh. That's doing it as a function of the decay time. Oh. To do the T dependence, you have to create these T odd observables. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are four body final states where you create these vector oh, so triple products. Uh, th that is things that people will do, but right. that's also being done elsewhere. Oh. Rohini. <clears throat> Jim, just one quick question. Thanks for a really wonderful talk. Uh, these uh, limits that you have on Z prime, uh, I mean, these uh, you you mean to say these regions are allowed after the uh, in spite of the invisible decay limits from left on Z prime? Yeah, I see. So these these are ah, so okay. the uh, the only limits that come are from recasting some neutrino results, I believe, from these experiments. But why does left doesn't have? Um, Lab had pretty good limits on invisible branching ratio. I mean, that's how we excluded this is, both generation. This is Z, Z, this is Z prime, right? It's a Z prime. Yeah, which doesn't couple to the electrons. So we never made them at LEP. It's a very special. If, if it exists, we never made them at LEP. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, what you are going to do with charms, Manink? What are the physics measurements you're going to do with charms? Charm? Yeah, with charms. Um, uh, we've measured the lifetimes. Um, so 
Okay, uh, as was discussed by Rukmani, LHCB has measured uh, very precisely now these X and Y parameters. Mm -hmm. So the mixing measurements are very hard for us to make any competitive uh, measurement on. Um, however, there are sort of uh, direct CP measurements that we can make in particular because these CPS images have been seen in KK and PiPi, Pi, or particularly PiPi, Pi, we can do PI0, zero, PI0, zero, which is cannot be done at, at uh, LHCB. And with a very large data set, we should have a precision which is able to probe the region that's being seen by LHCB. So there are other modes with neutrals which we can do really well. However, you know, classic mixing and time dependent measurements are really quite tough for us compared with the great progress that LHCB has made over the years. Thanks a lot. Jim. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, so at the present, no. Yeah. We want to accumulate as much data as we it's possibly can months. with the Upsilon 4S. So there are some plans for potentially doing scans to do quaconium in that region, but at the moment there is there is no plan to take a significant amount of time away from the, the 4S program. If, uh, one second, well, not that. Once we're in this regime, yeah, we would certainly consider taking time away from the 4S. But for now, given anomalies, given all these things, that's the focus. Okay, one last question. Manoraj. Uh, James, uh, in continuation with the Z prime thing, in the lab, uh, there is a data me, uh, missing momentum along with a photon. Uh, that can that can rule out uh, the Z primes uh, to some extent. Is it easy to look for? So, so I, you're talking about lab data. Lab data. Lab measure means missing momentum along with the photon. Well, what a photon type of thing. Monophoton again because you didn't produce the Z prime because what was it? No, Z prime gives you the missing momentum. Ha ha, but this is Rohini's question. We want your Z prime is coupling to the leptons, right? So you'd you'd have to have the Z prime coming from a mu plus mu minus or a tau pair. It have to be this this Z prime strahlen process. This it's the production. L, L, L mu minus L tau. Mm. Mix with yeah. Right. Bias. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, have you updated the bounds on axion-like particles similar to the Z prime? Um, so um, we haven't updated that. Where did that come from? It's very right disorientating. Here. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so we had a result a few years ago from a three photon search, um, but that has not been updated, but it is being updated. There will be new results soon. That was done with a tiny amount of data, less than an inverse density bar of data, but it's coming. Okay. So a lot of interest in Bell2. So we look forward for more results. Okay, okay. thanks a lot, Jen.